Okay. Uh, so this is rotation two, um, which will cover electronic properties of materials. Uh, we only have three labs for this rotation. So today will just be an introduction and I'll talk about um, some background on circuits and the math to calculate voltage and current in a circuit that you will need to know in order to do the analysis on some of the, the data we collect throughout the labs. And then I, I'll also talk uh, briefly about dielectric materials and dielectric properties. So the, these, these materials we won't uh, be looking at in lab. So I thought I could take this time to talk about these type of materials um, and give you a bit of exposure to those materials. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start by looking at um, what a circuit is. So circuit, the word comes from the Latin root circuitus, which means to go around. And so it has many related words like circle, circumference, and so on, something having to do with like the perimeter or going around something. Um, so here's some examples of different circuits. For example, we'll be dealing with uh, electric circuit diagrams in uh, this lecture, calculating voltage and current across elements like resistors. Here's an image of an integrated circuit. It's a microchip that's been cut away and you can see the integrated circuit inside the microchip. And these are uh, semiconductive materials, uh, diodes and transistors inside on that microchip. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen like the, the full component, but I, I, I didn't know before seeing this how small they actually were on the inside. And most, most, most of it is much just packaging. Um, and the actual chip itself is much smaller than that. And then here's another example of a circuit is the Circuit of Americas is a race course. So just to go with fit with the definition of circuit, it means, you know, to go around. There's many other ways we can use the word circuit, not just for electronics, but there's a, another type of circuit not related to electronics. Uh, so let's go over some common circuit elements. Uh, so there, there, there are many different types of elements that go in a circuit, but these are just some of the most common ones and we'll deal with some of them today. Uh, most common probably is the resistor is a passive element. The resistor will resist the flow of an electric current. Uh, okay. Um, so many resistors kind of look like this that you're familiar with and they have these different bands, different colors and the different colors and the different bands, they, they indicate the resist, the resistance of the resistor. And there's a chart that you can find that they can tell you which colors and which bands will will tell will tell you the value. Um, for 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 myself, I'm colorblind, so it's very difficult to actually see like differentiate between red and green. Um, I think for I've heard for electrical engineers, uh, the people that are colorblind uh, have a fairly difficult time because a lot of electrical engineering deals with these color coordinated systems. Um, and there's other types of resistors. These are like surface mount resistors or a smaller profile that you can put on like a circuit board or solder on. <clears throat> the next element is a capacitor. So a capacitor uh, stores energy in an electric field. Um, it also, it, once a electric field has been built up in the capacitor, it will resist a change in voltage. So for example, if you had a circuit with a capacitor in it and it's been charged up and let's say you switch the circuit off or you break the circuit, the capacitor will try to maintain that voltage by discharging its, uh, its energy uh, for a bit of time. So that's, that's a capacitor. Um, uh, it, also important to point out that current cannot flow through a capacitor once it's been charged. So I mean, it's a, it's a break in the line, you, you could say, um, except for AC current. You can pass an alternating current between a capacitor, but um, uh, not, not a direct current. An inductor is just a wire that has a, a lot of coils. Inductors store energy in the form of a magnetic field. And they, uh, similar to a capacitor, they, but instead of storing an electric field, they store a magnetic field and they resist the change in current. So if we had a circuit running at a certain current and then we break the circuit uh, and cut the current off, the inductor will try to supplement that lost current by discharging its energy, its stored energy. So they look like uh, these uh, wrapped coils, usually wrapped around, a, I believe, a ferromagnetic material, uh, making this solenoid, um, and they can come in different shapes. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the capacitors. There's different types of capacitors. So these are like ceramic capacitors, and these are electrolytic capacitors. Where the, the electrolytic capacitors 
uh, usually are polarized. So there, there'll be one side that has to be the negative side uh, because these, these are inside the, these capacitors, there's like a electrochemical reaction that's taking place and it can only be in a certain positive, either positive potential or negative potential that it, it can't be the reverse potential. It's just, just similar to a, like a battery. You can't, can't just flip the battery, turn it around and it, it's going to, uh, putting a negative voltage across a vac battery would, would ruin it. Same with these capacitors. And then a diode, um, a diode, it, diodes and transistors are semiconductive devices. So a diode is actually a combination of two semiconductors, an N-type and a P-type semiconductor. And its function is to allow current to flow in one direction through the circuit, but it does not allow current to flow in the opposite direction. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a valve, a check valve that just allows flow in one direction, but not the other. Um, so there's you know, different types of diodes. Um, and in our labs, the next week, we will be looking at the characteristics of a diode. Uh, LED, a light emitting diode, is a type of diode. And I'm sure you've, you've experienced from our previous quarters when we worked with LEDs that the, the, the current can only flow in one direction. You cannot, you have to make sure the LED is in the right orientation, otherwise it won't light up because it's a diode. Um, and then transistors, again, is another semiconductive material. It's a combination of either uh, N-type, P-type uh, material. Um, we will be looking at uh, a transistor. However, now that I remember, we're not actually looking, well, you'll see, <laughs> but we're looking at the material inside the transistor and not like actual transistor uh, itself. We're just looking at the transistor material. And in any case, transistors act as a switch so they can turn a signal on or off. And this is the basis for all computing because if you can have a switch that gives an on or off signal, then you can do all computation in a uh, base two uh, math. And so all computers rely on transistors in order to uh, make those computations. Before the invention of transistors, uh, we had something called vacuum tubes and uh, it worked in a similar way that it would, it would deliver an on or off value, but they were, they were much, they weren't compact, they were much bigger. It required you know, a, a coil that would heat up uh, this environment and it would emit electrons in one direction. And then, so it, allow, it would allow the current kind of a flow in one direction, not the other, so like a diode. Anyways, so since the invention of the transistor, we can miniaturize these components a lot more. And an example of that miniaturization is in a computer chip. So this is an example of an Intel uh, computer chip, a CPU, a, a central processing unit. So in all your computers and all your cell phones and you know, everything uh, that does computation will have uh, a chip like this that does those computations. And inside the chip, there are many transistors. Now I, I asked the morning class and I'll ask you guys too. Oops, oops, sorry. Um, how many transistors do you think are inside one of these computer chips? So here's, here's an example of just one transistor, but how many do you think are able to be put into your computer chip? Uh, or a, a ballpark estimate, how many do you think? And I, I have my, my computer. Oh, <laughs> say again? <laughs> At least 10? At least 10. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's correct. So John, uh, you say uh, billions, and yeah, that's correct. There are billions of transistors inside your computer chips. And so for an example, I, I took the computer, uh, the CPU chip that's in my computer that I'm using now. It's, a, it's an eight-year-old chip I got in 2012. It's a, um, an a Intel i5-3570 and, and so on. Anyway, so I looked it up and it has 2.1 billion transistors inside the ch chip. So that means it can make, it can make a, a, you know, the more transistors you have, the more processes you can have and that, and that increases the speed of the computation. Um, and the, the transistor that's inside my chip, the, the size of the transistor is 22 nanometers. And I think now today there's, it's even smaller. It's, it's like 11 or so nanometers. Uh, and so, you know, every, that, that fits that, um, that law. I forget what that law was called. If someone knows the, the, what I'm talking about, they can blurt it out, where every year 
the size of the transistor decreases. Moore's law, thank you, yeah, Moore's law. So every, something, and I forget exactly what it was, but like every so often or every year, the size of the transistor decreases a certain amount and it fits some trend, right? Now, that, that's been true up until, I believe, recently. And the problem is there's a limit on how small we can actually make a transistor. And you guys know why? Why is there a limit how small we can make the transistor? I, I can think of actually two. Of tunneling? Yeah, one reason is tunneling, that's correct. So if you make something too small, you're, you, you know, the, the purpose of the transistor is to, to, to stop current or stop voltage, yeah, stop current and then turn it on, right, it's a switch. But if you make it too small, you'll have electron tunneling and it'll just go through without, without any um, you know, switch uh, involved. The other problem is that the smaller you make these materials, Remember, for tr transistors are made of uh, doped semiconductors, N-type and P-type doped silicon. And the, on the, the order of doping is like one part per million or one part per billion. It's a very small amount of dopant that's added to the material. And the smaller you make the material, the more crucial the, is the, the accuracy of the dopant, right? So if, if you're making it really small, you're only, you only have like a million atoms in your transistor. And so you, you, only ha you can only put in one, you can only substitute one or, or put in one dopant. And so it's easy to you know, mess that up. So on a smaller scale. All right, let's move on. So uh, talk about some measuring devices that are commonly used uh, and will be used in our labs. So we have uh, the voltmeter measures the electrical potential between two points in, in parallel to those points. So uh, we'll talk a, a bit more about that. The ammeter is, uh, measures the current that's in series with a circuit. So a voltmeter is in parallel, ammeter is in series, excuse me, and the ohm meter measures electrical resistance, again, in parallel. Well, actually, I mean, really, ohm meter would be really in series, but it, you, sh you shouldn't be using the ohm meter as part of a circuit. It doesn't, it doesn't I'll, I'll talk about it later. But so these three things, um, they, they are three different instruments, right? There's three different mechanisms that would, in these instruments that would allow for these measurements. Um, and, you know, historically before digital processes, these were all like analog and they would have to have these three different, you'd have three separate instruments for this. But now we have digital multimeters. And I, I guess there's also analog multimeters, but uh, digital multimeters that incorporate all three of these and many other uh, things inside of them. So these are examples of some digital multimeters. So they can measure current, they can measure voltage, uh, resistance, and they can measure other things. Some of them measure temperature or light or capacitance um, and some other things. So you know, here's an example of like a, a hand uh, uh, clip on one where if you clip it around a wire that has a current, I think, I believe through induction, you can you can measure like the current or the voltage, which is, is quite handy for electrical engineer. If you, if you want to probe something and you don't want to make contact with the actual wire itself or have to find contact points to probe it. And then there's also desktop versions that are more sensitive. And so, so some of our labs will be using the desktop version for a, a four probe uh, Kelvin clip measurement. And um, these are all made by the Fluke brand. Fluke is a, a very well-known brand, a very high quality brand of, uh, and a rather expensive brand of multimeters. So here's some definitions that we'll go over. Um, and most of this, you know, you should already know through like a freshman or sophomore phys physics classes, but just as a review to get you guys ready for next week's labs. Um, so voltage is the difference in electric potential between two points. Um, in other words, you know, is, it's also equated as the amount of work required to move one coulomb, or excuse me, one unit of charge between two points. The units of voltage is the volt, and that's equivalent, like I said, is one joule of work per coulomb of charge. And if you remember, one elementary charge, which uh, would be like a proton or an electron or um, a, a, cat, a monovalent cation or anion have an uh, elementary charge of one, and that is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And one mole of that elementary charge, so one mole of ions, for example, monovalent ions, is equal to one, this is F for Faraday. One Faraday is a constant at 96,000 coulombs per mole. 
Um, it's important to distinguish this. We'll be talking about capacitance later. Capacitance has units of farad, which is different than this constant, which is Faraday. Okay, so here I, I can give an example of one volt of potential difference. So if you take two isolated metal plates and they're conductive plates, I guess they don't, they don't necessarily need to be conductive, but they're two isolated plates and by themselves they have a voltage of zero. And we were to take one unit of charge, or excuse me, or in this example, one coulomb of charge, and we were to move it to the other plate, or rather separate it from its, its neutral state on one plate. And let's suppose that took one joule of work. If that takes one joule of work to move one coulomb of charge, then the potential difference between those two plates is one volt. It doesn't matter how close the plates are. If it took one joule of work to move it, it's going to be one, a potential difference of one volt between those two plates. So, you know, what, what could be doing that work to move that charge? And, you know, it could be an electrochemical cell or like a battery could be what moves or like has that uh, potential difference to separate that charge. So an analogy that's often used with voltage and other uh, definitions is uh, a water system. So imagine if you have a water tank, two water tanks that are connected, and one water tank is at a higher elevation than the other, kind of like a, a dam and a reservoir of water, right? There's a potential energy for the water at the higher level to flow to the lower level, right? So that potential energy is analogous to the change in potential uh, uh, voltage, that is. So uh, here I have to demonstrate potential energy is equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration times the height. And I rearrange this equation. So we say one joule of work or one joule of energy is equal to one coulomb times one volt. Okay, so in this anal analogy, you could think of uh, mass times acceleration equivalent like to coulombs and then voltage is uh, analogous to the height of the system. Okay, and then in this, this uh, example, we have a pump that's, that take, does, inputs the work to move the water back to the top of the system, that which could be analogous to say a battery in a circuit that could uh, you know, put some uh, charge at a higher potential. Okay. <clears throat> so that is voltage. Now let's look at current. So current is the net flow of electric charge. And I want to emphasize that it's net flow and not just, just, not just the speed or not just the, the movement of charge itself, but the net uh, flux of, of charge. It has uh, the units of ampere, that one ampere or one amp is equal to one coulomb of charge per second. Okay, so in this example, we have a wire, a conductive metal wire, and there's zero voltage difference. There's zero potential difference between the two sides. So in that case, uh, you know, what is the, the current? Well, the current is going to be zero because there's zero net flow in, of charge in the material. However, it's still important to, to realize that the electrons themselves are still moving, the free electrons, that is, the conductive electrons are still moving uh, fairly rapidly within the material um, and, and with maybe random motion when they collide with you know, other atoms, they will deflect uh, their, their trajectory. And that collision, um, the distance they move until collision is called the mean free path or rather the, the average distance these electrons or particles travel before colliding is called the mean free path. And for, uh, I found a paper that uh, calculated different elements and their mean free paths. And so we, we look at silver, for example. Silver has, uh, the electrons in silver have a mean free path of 53 nanometers, which is uh, quite large uh, if you think about it, because we, we can make nanoparticles of silver, you know, around 10 nanometers very easily. And so it's possible to make particles that have a dimension that is smaller than the mean free path, meaning that the electrons will not bump into any other atom for 53 nanometers, which I think is, is quite large distance. And it kind of gives you an idea of how empty atoms really are, right? Remember, a, you know, when we think of a, a atomic model of metal, we always think of the hard sphere model. And you know that's that's a good approximation to think of bonding uh, bond distances between atom centers. But you know, in reality, the these electron clouds are mostly empty 
Uh, and so the electrons can zing through without any deflection at all. Okay, um, so let's move on. So let's suppose that instead of zero volts, we, we put a potential difference across these, uh, the two ends of this wire. So we have a one volt potential difference, for example. Then what is, you know, what would we expect to happen? And what would happen is that we would have a net flow of electrons. Um, in this case, this is a positive potential. And by convention, current flows from positive to negative potential. And I mean, by convention, by definition, current is the movement of positive charge. But you know, realistically, we think of the movement of electrons, which are negative charge. So the electrons will flow in the opposite direction of current. So that's why they, they're flowing to this higher potential, which is a lower potential for the electrons, but higher potential for protons or positive charge. Okay. Um, and so one, one question I have for you guys is how fast do you, you think these electrons are moving? All right, so uh, you say speed of sound in the object. Um, hey, that, that's a pretty good guess. Um, however, I would say no, not quite. The speed of sound does relate to, uh, I'd say, mechanical motion. I think it's more related to the mechanics, right? You know, like if you, if you bump the material, the material can only uh, be mechanically um, you know, sensitive as fast as the speed of sound, right? So that has to do with the, the bonding of vibrations, you could say, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so that, uh, a good, good guess, but not quite. So it's a bit of a trick question, kind of, because you could think of this in two ways. One is, like I said, these electrons are moving in random directions all the time at very high speeds, and that speed is about a third of the speed of light, so around 100,000 meters per second, so very, fairly quickly. However, uh, if we want to specify how fast is the the net flow of electrons you know towards to this positive potential uh, that's a bit a bit slower um, so if we were to draw an imaginary line here uh, imaginary cross section in this wire and the question is you know what's the net flow the speed of the net flow of electrons you know it depends on several things such as you know of course the current because that if that is the net flow of electrons um, electron density of the material so how many electrons per volume inside the material, that's a material property, and then the cross-sectional area that we're looking at. So remember, current is coulombs per second, but I guess my question is, you know, how can we turn this into centimeters per second, okay? Uh, so if we, let's assume some things, let's assume that the current in this wire is one amp or one coulomb of charge per second flowing through this, this cross-section. The, the electron density, and let's say this is a copper wire, of uh, copper is 8.45 times 10 to the 22 electrons per cubic, excuse me, centimeter. And the cross-sectional area is about 0 0.01 centimeters squared. That's about, uh, that's a little bit bigger than a wire with one millimeter di uh, diameter. Um, <clears throat> so we can, we can solve this to turn, you know, current from coulombs in a sec per second into centimeters per second. Um, using, and I always forget this, and I asked the, the morning class this as well, was it called uh, different, I always want to say differential analysis, but that's not right. What is this called? Uh, dimensional analysis, dimensional analysis, right? So we just, we, we plot them in and we, we take off the, the units until we get into centimeters per second. So we start with one amp coulombs per second. There is a conversion here that hasn't been mentioned, but it was mentioned on the last slide. One electron has a elementary charge of a negative 1. 1. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right, so now we get rid of coulombs. We have electrons per second now passing through this point times the electron inverse of the electron density. So now we got centimeters cubed per second and then divide by the cross-sectional area. So that turns into centimeters per second. And so when you do that calculation, you end up with what's called the drift velocity of the net electron flow. And this comes out to be negative 0.007 centimeters per second. So, so in reality, the a, a net flow of electrons in a wire of this size and this material 
for one amp, which is a quite a bit of current, is very slow, very slow, and especially relative to the actual electron speed. Um, the reason why this is negative, again, is just by convention, these electrons flow in the opposite direction of the current, right? Current would be right to left, but in this case, uh, electron flow is to higher positive potential. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh, so still on this slide. So yeah, it's called drift velocity. The drift velocity is related to the, the charge mobility, uh, the mobility of the elect electron mobility or in, or in P type materials might be the hole mobility. Um, and so I'm sure you've talked about this in your last quarter's class, electronic properties. Uh, the mobility is a material property. So here, uh, drift velocity of these uh, electrons equivalent to the electron mobility times the electric field. Electric field is just the voltage divided by the distance that it, it's across. Okay. Okay. So let's look at resistance. Resistance is the opposition to uh, electron flow or current. And um, also another way of looking at resistance, it converts electrical energy into thermal energy. All right. <clears throat> and I, I think you, you guys did that in um, the, your autumn quarter. You were looking at the power drawn from a light bulb. I guess you weren't really looking, but you, you calculated resistance and you could, you know, power of the light bulb or rather energy uh, or watts, uh, joules per second is power, is how much energy is being converted into thermal energy, which also from a, a consequence of that, it gives off light for, a, for an incandescent light bulb. <clears throat> so resistance has a unit of ohms, which is equivalent to just by Ohm's laws, one volt per ampere, uh, but it also has equivalent units of joules, seconds per coulomb squared, because a volt is a joule per coulomb and ampere is a coulomb per second. Um, the inverse of resistance is conductance with, with a symbol G. So just the inverse, the reciprocal of resistance. <clears throat> and it has units of Siemens. Resistivity is a material property where resistance is not, resistance depends on the dimension of the material. Resistivity is independent of the dimension or volume of the material. Resistivity is rho, which is a bit confusing because in the last slide I used rho as de electron density, but now I'm using it as resistivity is equal to the resistance times the area of your object uh, divided by the length of the object. And so it has units ohm meters. It's, it's important to uh, take a note that these are kind of weird units. You know, it has meters here and that's because you're multiplying by area and dividing by length. So resistivity is an intrinsic property, all right? And resistance is an extrinsic property. So in this example, I have a, a, a wire of a length uh, 10 meters, cross-sectional area is one centimeter squared. So kind of a, a pretty, pretty big wire. And uh, so if you wanted to calculate the resistance of that wire, and let's suppose it's copper, which has a resistivity of 1.7 micro ohms per, uh, not per, 1.7 micro ohm centimeters, then you can calculate the resistance of that length of wire. Uh, and so that comes out to 1.7 ohms uh, using that equation. All right, so uh, it pretty, that's pretty low resistance, especially for such a, a, long, a long wire. And you know, that's why we use our, the power cables, the transport power or electricity, it needs to be made out of a wire or material that has low resistance or low resistivity rather, right? So copper is a, a good material to use. A better material would be a superconductor that doesn't have any resistance, but that's a bit pricey. Okay. <clears throat> so back to the water analogy. Um, so here we have an entire circuit, the battery, a resistor, the current through the circuit. And so again, like I said, the, the, the voltage 
across the battery is analogous to the height of the water that has potential energy to flow. The current in the circuit is analogous to the flow of volume. So not, not the speed of water because uh, the, the current through the system, the current through the circuit needs to be the same through the entire circuit. What, you know, whatever the number of charges per second out of the battery needs to be equal to the number of charges per second into the battery. Even through the resistor, the current needs to be the same. So it's the same in this analogy, the flow of volume of water passing through this constriction, which is, acts like the resi resistor, needs to be the same. So that means that the speed of flow, the velocity of water in this uh, constriction must be faster in, in order to make the same amount of flow. So flow of water is like the current, this constriction is like the resistance, the height of the potential energy is like the voltage. And if we were to have a battery, it could be like a pump that pumps the water back to the top. So these three uh, things are related by Ohm's law, which is voltage equals the current times the resistance. And so here's an example of how you could use Ohm's law to calculate current in a circuit. So here's a simple circuit. We have a, a constant voltage power supply, for, for example, maybe like a battery, although batteries are not necessarily constant voltage because the voltage depends on the current and most of it, it doesn't matter. If the constant voltage is power supply, we'll say it's at 10 volts. Here we have an ammeter to measure the current. We have a resistor in series with the circuit. And like I said, the volt voltmeter is in parallel to what, whatever element you want to measure. Now, uh, one assumption we have to make in these, these simple circuits is that the, the resistance of the wire is negligible. And we'll just say it's zero for now, that the resistance in the wire is negligible. The only resistance we're in, we're, we care about is the resistance of the resistor, which is put at one kilo ohms. So if we were to measure the voltage across this resistor, what would that voltage measure? What would this voltmeter measure? So that's a question for you guys. What, and this one's kind of easy to think about. What would that voltage be? Aaron says 10 volts, and that's correct. So because this is the only element in this circuit, and you know, if you look at this, we have a probe of the voltage above the resistor and a probe below it. This would be exactly the same if we took this probe and put it over here and measured the voltage across the, the voltage source. It's the same thing as what we're doing right now. So we're just measuring the voltage of the voltage source, source basically. So the voltage drop the voltage drop across the resistor is equal to the voltage provided by the power supply, which would be 10 volts. So if that voltage is 10, um, then we can calculate the current using Ohm's law. And it's a bit simple, so I'll just do it for you guys. So using Ohm's law, we say the current across the resistor is equal to the voltage drop across the resistor, which is 10 volts, divided by the resistance of the resistor, which is one kilo ohm, so 1,000 ohms. So 10 divided by 1,000, that's uh, 10 milliamps. So that's the amount of current that goes to the resistor. And remember, like I said, the current that comes out of the power supply must be equal to the current that goes into the power supply. You can't have an accumulation of charge anywhere in the circuit. Uh, you have to have equivalent, or you have to have charge balance, that is. So the number of coulombs per second out is equal to the number of coulombs per second in. So that must mean the current through the resistor is, is all, and all the wires are all the same. So here's another question. I have a couple more questions for you guys. Uh, first one is, which direction does the current flow in this circuit? All right, we have, uh, we have two options. It can flow in the clockwise direction or the counterclockwise direction. Uh, so just for some participation, say yes or no in the chat, if yes for clockwise and no for counterclockwise. Let's get people participating. 
Okay, so a lot of people are saying no. What did I say no was? I said no was counterclockwise. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. There's, there are a lot of no's. Counterclockwise. So no, the, act, the answer is yes. It goes clockwise. Right, yeah, clockwise. So remember, the current, by definition, or I guess by, de yeah, the convention or definition is the flow of positive charge. So positive charge flows from the positive terminal of the power supply to the negative terminal of the power supply. So positive charge is flowing. Oh, I have a picture, I think. Let me, uh, <laughs> the current is flowing in the clockwise direction. Okay. Which means that the electrons are flowing in the opposite direction, counterclockwise. So electrons come out of the negative terminal and they flow into the positive terminal. All right. Um, how about, how about this, this uh, little circuit right here? We have another loop here. Uh, the voltage is also connected there. Is there any current that goes through this voltmeter? So there, there, ideally, ideally there's no current that flows through the voltmeter. Now in reality, yeah, there, there has to be a little bit of current in order for the voltmeter to measure there has to be a little bit of current. And voltmeters are typically what we call high impedance devices. So impedance related to resistance, it means that the resistance across the voltmeter is very high. It's like, uh, I think that for very cheap multimeters, it's like 10 mega milli ohms, milli, mega ohms, 10 mega ohms, and then higher end, more accurate, precise uh, multimeters is like giga ohms. So very, because the resistance is so high in the voltmeter, very little current will go through this loop here, which will allow you to accurately measure the voltage across the resistor. Okay, okay, one more question before we move on. Uh, you know, let's say instead of measuring the voltage across the resistor, let's say we measure the voltage across the ammeter. So we take these, these voltage points, these probes, and put it one before and one after the ammeter. Or, or to make it even more simple, just say we measure it across two points of the wire down here. There's nothing between it, just one point there and one point there. Question is, what would we measure? What would the voltage measure if we just measured two points on this wire? Or, or across the ammeter in an ideal situation. There, there's probably going to be some resistance to the ammeter, but you know, theoretically. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I see so zero volts. That's right. So yeah, so there'd be zero volts uh, in a theoretical situation. Like I said, we're assuming there's no resistance in these wires, only in the resistor. Now, I, uh, in reality, there, there is a little bit of resistance in the wires. And so if we were to measure two points between wires that have a certain amount of resistance, we would, and the current, we know the current has to be the same. The current has to be 10 milliamps through the entire system. So then you could, you would expect a little bit of voltage. But like I said, because resistance is so small and we're assuming it's zero, it should be zero volts. Okay, let's move on. So let's look at, uh, two resistors, and these resistors are in series, all right? So they're one after another, they're in the same circuit, and they're in the same loop, okay? We can still use Ohm's law to calculate the current through the system. Uh, the question is, what is the voltage drop across each of these resistors, all right? So when you have uh, resistors in series, multiple resistors, the voltage drop across all the resistors is, like we said, the same as the power supply. If we were to put the multimeter across both of these, it'd be just like putting the multimeter across the power supply. So there's 10 volts of potential from top to bottom of these two resistors. And then the total resistance is just the sum of these two resistors. If we were to, we could make a, a simplification and say these two resistors is equivalent to one 10 kilo ohm resistor. Okay. So if we know the voltage across both the resistors, let's see. And we know, we know 
the voltage across both resistors and we know the the resistance of both resistors, the total resistance, which is 10 kilo ohms, then you can calculate using Ohm's law, the current through the entire system, right? So we have a total of 10 kilo ohms of resistance, a total of 10 volts. So the same as before, the current through the system will be 10 milliamps. And now you know the current, the current in R1 is equal to the current in R2, which is the current provided by the voltage power supply. So then you can use Ohm's law again to calculate the voltage drop across each of these resistors given the resistance and the current. Um, another, uh, just the equation itself, to make it easy, is that the voltage drop across a single resistor in series is equal to the fraction of its resistance to the total resistance. All right, so in this case, for the three kilo ohm resistor, it'd be 10 volts times three divided by 10. So 30% of 10, basically, right? So this has 30% of the voltage drop. This has 70% of the voltage drop, okay? And it doesn't matter if, you know, R1 is first or R1 is second, okay? It'd still be three and seven. It depends on the ratio of the resistance between the two, or rather the fraction between the two, okay? Um, yeah, again, the current, you can look at the, the, like I said, you could do it from the total resistance and the total voltage, or you can just look at the individual uh, resistor and this calculation still works, you know, for three volts across three kilo ohms, and uh, you can use Ohm's law and that equals one milliamp. Oh wait, did I say one milliamp? Okay, I, excuse me, I, I said 10 milliamps before, but it's, it's, it's one because I forgot. We have 10 kilo ohms. In the previous example, it was only one kilo. Okay. Uh, so it's basically, uh, overall, you need to remember that current through the entire system is equivalent to all elements in series. Okay. Let's look at another example. This is the last one, is the resistors in parallel. Okay. <clears throat> so in this example, again, we have a constant voltage supply of 10 volts. But what's different is that now there is a junction where the wire splits. Okay, so we have two resistors in parallel, and then the wire uh, has another junction where they combine again. Okay, and so the question again, what is the voltage across both the resistors and what is the current across both resistors? So in the previous case in series, we said the current in series is equal, right? The current is constant through the entire circuit, but what's different is the voltage. In parallel, it's the opposite. The voltage across these two junctions is equal, or in other words, the voltage across R1 is equal to the voltage drop across R2, but what is different is the current. And remember I said, whatever current goes in, in this case, whatever current splits, needs to be equal to the current that gets combined at this junction, okay? You can't have accumulation or depletion of current anywhere in this, this circuit. Uh, so like I said, the voltage, difference between these two junctions or across each of these resistors is 10 volts, which is given by the power supply. Now we want to calculate the current I1 and I2 through each of these resistors and then also the total current. So remember I said the, the, junk, the, the total current in has to be equal to these two currents. So I total is equal to I1 plus I2. Um, we know the voltage across each resistor we know the resistance, we can use Ohm's law to calculate I1 and I2 individually. So Ohm's law gives us I1, 3.3 milliamps, I2, 1.4 milliamps, and then the total current given by the power supply or supplied by the power supply is the sum of those two currents, 4.7 milliamps. Okay, uh, the other way you could do it, there's an equation to to calculate the equivalent resistance. If we were to, if we were to combine these two and make a simple simplification, that total resistance, the reciprocal is equal to the, the, uh, the reciprocal sum. And then the total current, just you can plug this into Ohm's law again to get the total current is another way of doing it. Okay, so that was, we were looking at circuits in series, circuits in parallel to measure uh, current and voltage across resistors using Ohm's law. So in lab next week, uh, you will need to be able to measure the voltage and current and convert it to current. 
but it will only be for resistors in series. There won't be any parallel work. And it, it'll be very simple, just like this. You, you'll have at most two elements. You'll have a resistor and a diode. You're going, the, the experiment will be measuring voltage across a resistor. You'll have to calculate current or something like that, right? So not too complicated at all. Um, there's, a, there's a class in electrical engineering. Some of you might have taken it is Electrical Engineering 215. Um, so it's, I, I believe it's the introduction to electrical engineering. Um, I took it when I was an undergraduate and it was, in my opinion, a difficult class. I think it's a weed out class for electrical engineering students, but I, I, I ended up switching to pass fail because I was, I was afraid I wasn't going to pass the, I was afraid I wasn't going to get a good grade. And actually I did kind of okay, but because I switched to pass fail, it meant I have to, I had to take an, an additional elective to meet my requirements, which kind of was too bad, but. Anyway, so that's available. If you're interested in this sort of thing, electrical engineering, there's that class. I would recommend it if you're interested. Uh, it, like I said, it, it was kind of difficult. <clears throat> okay. So now I would like to talk about dielectric materials uh, to wrap this lecture up. Um, it, we won't be talking, uh, we won't be investigating it in lab. So I want to kind of introduce you to these, this class of materials. There is a class, a uh, senior level elective class, MSE 452, taught by Dr. Chow, which goes into much more detail with dielectric materials and piezoelectric, ferroelectric, and also uh, ferromagnetic materials. So if you're interested in this type of thing, I encourage you to enroll in that class. It's during winter quarter. So dielectric materials, so we look, let's look at the root of the word. So this time the prefix dia or di is Greek, meaning uh, through. So uh, it literally means uh, uh, electricity through a material, but it, it's kind of uh, not quite electricity. What it should be is electric field because dielectric materials are insulating materials. So electrons are not gonna be passing through these materials. These are Dielectric materials are insulating materials that are able to be polarized by an electric field. Okay, um, so polarization, there's the two different types uh, I show here, a permanent dipole, for example, like water molecule has a permanent dipole. There's an electronegativity difference and one side is more negative than the other side. Uh, so it can align it, the molecule can align itself with an electric field. And then there's uh, an induced dipole. So you can have just a, a neutral atom with an electron cloud. And if you put an electric field across that atom, the electron cloud will distort. And you'll have a, a side where the nucleus is and a side where there's more density of electron cloud. So that's an induced dipole. So in this example here, you have two parallel plates and you have a material in between the plates, uh, atoms or molecules. In this example, they're just, uh, for example, like water molecules and you can apply an electric field between the two plates and that will polarize the material, all right? So this material is considered the dielectric material, all right? And that will induce what's called a polarization field inside the dielectric and that will accumulate additional charges to the surface. So th this is like the basis of a capacitor is, is kind of like what, we're sh what I'm showing you right here. So there are four different types of polarization mechanisms in materials. The one, one I already described is electronic polarization, where you have a, a atom with an electron cloud, you apply electric field and the proton kind of is attracted to the, is this the right side? Yeah, yeah, the electric field is always positive to negative. So the proton is, the nucleus is attracted to the, like the negative side of the electric field and the electrons are pulled to the, neg to the positive side. Uh, electronic, and then there's ionic polarization. So ionic uh, happens in all ionic solids. For example, this example is iron oxide, FeO, uh, iron two plus and oxygen two minus. And uh, at rest, they have a, a equilibrium bond distance, right? They're a, a, a distance at their uh, lowest energy. And if you apply an electric field across the material, then it'll pull the, the cation, the positive ion, towards the negative side of the electric field, and then the anion, the oxygen, towards the other side. And so you'll, you're changing the bond distance, and that's another form of polarization. And then also dipolar, or also called orientation, and I already mentioned this, with like a, a molecule that has a permanent dipole, 
can orient itself with an electric field. Um, and then last is space charge or interfacial. Uh, so this is uh, individual charges in the material that can are mobile and they can move or be separated to different sides. So in this example, you have a, a metallic material where you have surface charge on the material and at, at rest, they're, they're equally distributed. And then if you uh, apply an electric field, then you'll have an accumulation of negative charge on one side and positive charge on the other side, uh, just on the surface, okay? Um, but it, it doesn't have to be uh, electrons in a, in a conductive material for space charge. It could also be ions in a, like an electrolyte could also undergo space charge uh, polarization. And I think I, a good example of this, I believe, is uh, electrophoresis, which is used in biology. So I'm not too familiar with it, but if my understanding is, you know, if you want to separate DNA based on its chain length, you can use gel electrophoresis where you have like this gel and you have your DNA samples and I guess they're, they're they have different dyes or whatever. And you have an electric field and th these, these molecules are charged. So they'll be attracted to the electric field. And so they'll, they'll travel towards the electric field. And depending on the size of the molecule, they will travel a certain distance or the, you know, the larger the molecule, the slower it travels, right? So that's an example of the space charge polarization is that the, you're having these ions that are attracted to one side of the gel. And based on that, you could, you could, based on the distance it travels, you could tell something about the DNA. I'm not too sure. I'm not as uh, familiar with that subject. <clears throat> so that's space charge, electronic, ionic, dipolar. Uh, so you, you can think of, try to think of some materials that exhibit these different polarization mechanisms. And some, some, many materials will exhibit multiple polarization mechanisms. For example, water, it has its, its biggest mechanism is the dipolar mechanism, but it also has ionic polarization, right? Uh, I mean, you, you would, a lot, many people consider oxygen and hydrogen a covalent bond, which is correct but you still have a positive charge and a, a mostly negative charge. And so you could consider that the bond length, the bond length of oxygen and hydrogen will also change in an electric field, not just the molecule itself, but also the bond length. And that will contribute. It won't be the dominant contribution, but it will definitely contribute. Um, so can anyone think of a material? Well, let me, let me first say that all materials all materials that contain electrons have electronic polarization, right? It's guaranteed. If you, if you have atoms and you have electrons, you're gonna have electronic polarization. But can, you, can anyone think of a material that only has electronic polarization and none of the other polarization mechanisms? I'll give a couple hints. Uh, one, one material is a, a pure element, is one material. Uh, so Jordan, you say material or atom. Yeah, it could be a pure element. Is a, Definitely there's some examples of that. And then there's also some molecules that are examples. Some fairly, uh, very common molecules. Uh, hydrogen, so hydrogen gas. H2, for example, yeah, that would exhibit only electronic because there's no, there's no electronegativity difference between the two molecules of a hydrogen. I was also thinking nitrogen gas is the more common one. Uh, so you only have electronic. Uh, another example would be uh, the non-metal elements like silicon or germanium that don't have any free electrons. And uh, so they don't have any ionic polarization. They don't have Ideally, they don't have any space charge polarization, no dipolar, they only have electronic. But if you had a metal, like any of the metals that do have conductive electrons, then they would also have space charge uh, polarization. Okay, so let's move on to... <clears throat> so here's an example of a, uh, some dielectric properties. Uh, in this example, we have a capacitor. This is a parallel plate capacitor. And it's an ideal capacitor with just a vacuum in between two plates. Excuse me. So uh, the capacitance of these two parallel plates is a function of the area 
of the, the area of the plate divided by the distance of the plate. And there's a constant involved called the permittivity of free space, this epsilon naught, this permittivity of free space. It has, uh, in this case, the F is a farad, not Faraday, it's farads per meter, is a unit of capacitance is the farad. Uh, so it doesn't matter, capacitance doesn't depend on the voltage that you apply. Capacitance is a, proper, a device property of, this, of the capacitor. It doesn't depend on the, the voltage. So if we increase the area of these plates, you're increasing the capacitance. Or if you decrease the distance between the plates, you increase the capacitance, all right? And capacitance, if we apply uh, electric potential between the two plates and we generate electric field between the two plates, then we start accumulating these charge on the plate, all right? And so that's when voltage does come into account. So the, the voltage for a given voltage across the plates, you'll accumulate a certain amount of charge on those plates and that is related to the capacitance. So if you have a capacitor with higher capacitance, for a given voltage, you'll have more charge on the plate, okay? So now let's say we take the same parallel plate configuration and we insert a material, a material that's insulating. So this is our dielectric material, it's an insulating material. And we apply the electric field across the plate again. If it's a dielectric material, it becomes polarized and like I said before, it creates this polarization field in the opposite direction, all right? And this brings more charge to the surface. So we have two types of charges at the surface. So just by inserting a material, a dielectric material between these two plates, we're increasing Q, we're increasing the amount of charge at the surface. So for a given voltage, for the same voltage across the plates with a dielectric, we have more charge, which also means the capacity of this capacitor excuse me, not capacity. I always, I mix these up. You, you need to differentiate capacity from capacitance. The capacitance of this dielect of this capacitor is higher when we, in, if we just put a material in between the two plates compared to vacuum. Okay. And the amount of, the amount uh, or the increase in capacity, capacitance due to the dielectric, or I should say rather the, the ratio of the capacitance with the dielectric compared to the, to the capacitance without the dielectric is known as the dielectric constant. So here's the ratio of capacitance with and without the dielectric. So that ratio is the dielectric constant, also known as the relative permittivity, okay? And here's some examples of dielectric constant of different materials. For air, air is about one. Uh, by definition, vacuum is one because the, you know, it would be C naught over C naught would just be one. Air is more or less, we got the same uh, permittivity as vacuum. So it's about one. Water, on the other hand, is a very, as we know, is a very polar element, uh, molecule. And so it has a much higher uh, dielectric constant of 80. So just by adding water in, you're going to increase the capacitance, yeah, capacitance of your capacitor by 80 times. Uh, and then other ionic materials like lead zirconate titanate or PZT uh, has much higher uh, dielectric constant, 500 to 6,000, depending on other factors. <clears throat> so some different applications dealing with the dielectric constant. One uh, application of these dielectric materials is packaging or like electronic insulation. So for these type of materials, you want to have a material that has a low dielectric constant because if you want to isolate two like electric wires or two electric lines, you know, say you have an integrated circuit and you have two voltage lines and you want to isolate them, you don't want the, the, the charge difference to, to affect the voltage. So you want to have a low dielectric material the low dielectric constant material. So an example of that is printed circuit board, PCB, which is made out of a fiberglass uh, composite epoxy. And it has a relatively low dielectric constant around four. On the other hand, for applications like capacitors, you want to have a high dielectric constant because you want to increase the amount of charge, which would be capacity, the amount of charge that's accumulated on those surfaces of the, the capacitor. 
So uh, an example of a capacitor material with high dielectric constant is barium titanate, very similar to that last material, uh, lead zirconate titanate, the same crystal structure is uh, uh, the perovskite crystal structure. It has a very high dielectric constant. So this is, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe this is why water is not good for electronics, right? You know, you, you always know you shouldn't, you shouldn't mix water with electric circuits, right? But water itself is not, it's an insulating material, right? It doesn't conduct electricity very well. It has very high resistance, but because it's polar, it has a fairly high dielectric constant. So it acts as a capacitor. Like if you're just to put a capacitor between two wires in your circuit, you know, that's probably not going to be good for your circuit if you just insert a capacitor, right? So I think that's why water is not a good material. Uh, besides other reasons, there's other reasons, like if the voltage is, is high enough, you can break down the water and that causes corrosion and all that. But anyways, another dielectric property is called dielectric strength. Dielectric strength is the highest voltage you can go for a given distance before you start stripping the electrons out of the material in what you have, what's called dielectric breakdown. Okay, so imagine you had your parallel plate capacitor and you increase the voltage very, very high. You eventually you're gonna reach a voltage at this given distance where the electrons are just gonna be stripped from the material and you're essentially you're ionizing the material and you're, the electrons are, are flowing freely through material like a conductor. So that's dialectic strength. Um, so a, an example I always like to give is, you know, if you're, you're at your home and you're walking around and you touch the doorknob of a door and you get a spark and you get a shock, right? So that's, that's the dielectric breakdown of air, right? Your, your the electrons are jumping from your body to the doorknob or the opposite, the doorknob to the body, I'm not sure. And it's, going, it's traveling through the air. So the electrons in the molecules of air are ionizing and they're becoming uh, uh, electrically conductive. So the, my question is for you guys, how high of a voltage or electric, electric potential difference between you and the doorknob do you think it is for dielectric breakdown to occur? And so of course it depends, you know, what's this breakdown voltage is what I'm asking you guys. It depends on the distance you are. So let's, let's assume you have, uh, you get a spark at one millimeter. You have a spark gap of one millimeter. It's kind of small, right? So you make a spark. How, any ideas how high that voltage, any guesses what, what kind of voltage we're talking about? You know, ballpark, ballpark figures. So is it, is it uh, 10 volts? Is it under 10 volts? <clears throat> is it under 100 volts? <laughs> all right, over 10 volts. 10 volts of exactly. All right, all right, I'll move on. So it's, it's quite fascinating. The dielectric strength of air is three kilovolts per millimeter. So if you touch the doorknob and there's a spark between you and the doorknob, that's one millimeter, the voltage between you and the doorknob is three kilovolts, 3000 volts. So very high. And it, it, that makes sense because air, air is a, you know, it, it's insulating material, right? It, it takes a lot of potential to strip an electron away from a material, right? So 3,000 volts per millimeter for uh, the air to break down. Okay, uh, so another uh, engineering application of dielectric breakdown and dielectric materials is like a lighter, a gas lighter like this. Uh, so, you know, when you click the lighter, there's a material inside the lighter that generates a potential high enough to make a spark at the tip to ignite the fuel. And so again, you know, if you have one millimeter spark, you're generating thousands of volts potential. And so there's a device, there's a material inside this, this starter. And it's not, it's not like there's no battery, right? It's just a material that's by itself, it's passive. 
And that material is called a piezoelectric material. And we'll talk about that. And specifically, I believe the piezo, I could be wrong though. Um, I think it's PZT, but I could, I could be wrong. Actually, it might be quartz, so we'll move on. Uh, so piezoelectrics and also ferroelectrics are dielectric materials. And so what's special about piezoelectrics is that if we apply a strain or a stress on the material, if we squeeze the material, we distort the crystal structure in such a way that we induce a polarization in the crystal. Or in other words, we're, we're generating an electric field across the, the crystal, okay? There's a, there's a requirement in order for a material, in order for a crystal to be piezoelectric, to have piezoelectric properties, it has to have the following symmetry. It has to be non-centro, it has to have non-centrosymmetric symmetry. Where centrosymmetric symmetry means that the crystal has an inversion center. Inversion center is a type of symmetry where if we took one point on the crystal, like the unit cell, and we were to draw a line through the center and to the opposite side, the exact opposite, does the point on the opposite side, is it the same as the point that you started with? If it's the same, it means you have an inversion center. And if it has an inversion center, it means you have centrosymmetric symmetry. So in this example, I just demonstrated, you know, you take a point here, you go through the center, you end up on the exact opposite side. It's exactly the same uh, ion, for example. So it's centrosymmetric. In a non-centrosymmetric crystal symmetry, if you take a point, you go through the center of the unit cell, go to the opposite side, and it's not the same, like in this example here, it's non-centrosymmetric. And so how does that how does that give us piezoelectricity? Well, in a centrosymmetric crystal, if we apply a stress, we distort, we distort the crystal. And if we distort it, there's no net change in the dipoles, right? There, there's, there's dipoles between the anions and cations, but they're all, they all cancel out, right? But in non-centrosymmetric crystal, if you apply a stress and we distort the crystal, one side of the crystal is gonna have a net accumulation of positive charge, and the other side might have a net accumulation of negative charge, and that's gonna induce a a, bi a dipole or polarization, all right? So in piezoelectric materials, you can generate very high voltages. And in this example, high enough voltages to generate a spark. So that's thousands of volts uh, just by applying a stress on it. So in this device, the clicker, when you click it, it, there's a striker that strikes the piezoelectric material, the piezoelectric crystal inside here, and it strikes it so hard, there's so much strain on the crystal that it generates thousands of volts to make the spark. So that's a piezoelectric material. And so this is an example of applying a mechanical stress to, to induce a polarization. You can do the opposite. You can induce, or you can give it an electric field. You can polarize the material, put an electric field across, and that will induce a mechanical deformation. So it'll, it'll distort the lattice. And so the dimension of the material will change, right? And now let's suppose you have an alternating electric field. So the electric field's going one way and another way, and it's, it's switching. And then what happens to the, the crystal is that it's gonna get bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, right? Because of the piezoelectric effect. And if it, if it vibrates, and if the electric field is at a certain frequency, and its frequency is at an audible frequency, what happens is that your piezoelectric crystal will generate sound. So little tiny buzzers in little microelectronic devices typically are piezoelectric speakers that will you know, make, a, make a noise. Or for an example of this is, um, you know, if, you, if you ever get one of those birthday cards that make, like, have a sound or like a noise, it's usually sometimes it's a, a piezoelectric speaker that's making the, the, the song or whatever. Okay, um, and then going back to the original, another example of piezoelectric device is a microphone. So in many microphones, there is a piezoelectric crystal and the sound waves that we produce create vibrations on the material and it, it, it changes its dimension very slightly and that sends a signal, an electric signal that can be uh, transduced into a, a digital signal. So microphones use a piezoelectric uh, material as well. All right, so now let's talk about ferroelectrics, and this will be the last thing we talk about. Uh, ferroelectric materials 
by definition are also piezoelectric materials, okay? That means that they have to have non-centrosymmetric symmetry, um, but it's not necessarily that all piezoelectric materials are ferroelectric materials. Ferroelectric materials, the definition is that they have spontaneous polarization. So even without, in, with no in, uh, stress or strain on the material, they already exhibit a permanent dipole in the crystal. And then also by definition, they can reverse the direction of that dipole. So that's a ferroelectric. Um, oh, I, I missed the slide, sorry. To go back to piezoelectrics, here's an example of a piezoelectric crystal. This is quartz or silicon oxide, SiO2. So silicon is uh, tetrahedrally coordinated to oxygen. Again, you could argue that silicon and oxygen make covalent bonds, but in reality, it's, it's probably 50-50 covalent ionic bonding. So you would say that you know, there is a, a ionic uh, polarization between these, uh, these bonds. And it's because it this, has this tetrahedral coordination, if we look at the crystal symmetry, there is no inversion center. So if we take this point on the top left here, go through the center into the opposite corner, it's not the same point. So it's non-centrosymmetric, which means it's a piezoelectric material. If we apply a stress on the material, uh, we're going to push the negative charge to one side more than the positive charge and that induces a dipole. So quartz is a piezoelectric material and it's used in, uh, a bunch of different applications. I can't think of, uh, I, I know it's used like in radio transmitters, I believe, because it'll, it'll, it'll use as a, like a harmonic, like you'll send an AC field. It, you, you can make a piece of quartz and it, make it like a tuning fork, uh, the dimension. And if you send in an alternating field at a certain frequency, it'll resonate. And so based on the size of the quartz and the frequency, it does something for electronics. I'm really not sure, but uh, I know it's used in that way. Um, uh, also related to this, I, I know that we, we've used quartz piezoelectrics to measure the mass of something. I, I given, I've given this example before where when I, I was an intern at Toyota Technical Center, I did sputter coating and we had a sputter coater that had a quartz piezoelectric which would, would weigh the mass of whatever target you were sputtering onto. And so as you were adding, as you were depositing atoms to the surface of your, your target, the quartz piezoelectric could measure the dimension change because of the force of the atoms. And we're just, we're talking about, you know, a nanometer thick layer of atoms, and it could tell you uh, the thickness of the film based on the weight change because of the piezoelectric uh, signal from the quartz. All right. So back to ferroelectrics. Again, ferroelectrics exhibit, by definition, a spontaneous polarization, and that spontaneous polarization is reversible. Okay, so a very common example of ferroelectrics is a perovskite uh, crystal structure. Perovskites they have the ABO3 uh, chemical formula. A common perovskite uh, is uh, known as PZT, which is lead zirconate titanate. All right, so. Uh, the crystal structure itself has a non-closed packed oxygen lattice where you have this, this oxygen lattice uh, is in the octahedral configuration and the central ion is either titanium or zirconium. And then on the corners is the lead two plus, very large ion lead two plus. Okay. And at, uh, there's a certain temperature where the phase of the perovskite crystal structure will be cubic. Uh, and that's above uh, what's called the Curie temperature. And remember, if it's cubic, if we take a look at the symmetry, this cubic crystal structure has an inversion center and it is centrosymmetric. So at this temperature and this phase, this material is not a piezoelectric and it is not a ferroelectric. But below that temperature, there's a phase transformation into the tetragonal phase. And so tetragonal, you know, you take your cubic, the two faces, and you, you pull them apart you're pulling apart the poles of this octahedral, you're distorting this octahedral, this oxygen octahedral, all right? And what happens is that the central ion, the titanium or zirconium, is no longer energetically favorable to be right in the center. 
And here's an energy versus displacement diagram. The, the dashed line is the cubic phase. So for the ion to be right in the center is most energetically favorable. But then the solid line is when it forms into the tetragonal phase. And it's no longer energetically favorable to be right in the center of the unit cell. So it becomes displaced. It goes offset either to the top or the bottom. It doesn't matter. And so when it becomes displaced, then you see that you have more positive ions on the top half of this unit cell than you do have in the bottom half. So you have this induced polarization, or this spontaneous polarization, right? And so that fits the definition of the, the one part of the ferroelectric. And the other part, the other definition is that it's reversible. So you can apply a strong electric field that will force this ion onto the other side of the unit cell. So you can, re you can reverse the polarization direction, but that, that requires a very strong electric field. So as long as that electric field is lower than the dielectric breakdown of the material, then it could be considered a ferroelectric. If it's not, if it's not lower, if it has dielectric breakdown, then it's called a pyroelectric, but that's, that's more or less the same. So a common characterization of these ferroelectrics is this polarization versus electric field. Uh, so it, we're, in this characterization, you apply an electric field across the material and you're able to measure the polarization, the spontaneous polarization uh, or in, induced polarization of that unit cell. And so you see here, um, at zero electric field, you'll have a non-zero polarization, which is that spontaneous polarization. And it can be either positive or negative. And if you shift the electric field to negative direction past a chorus coercive uh, electric field, you'll be able to flip the ion to the other side. And then if you relax it back to zero, then it has uh, reversed polarization, spontaneous polarization at zero applied electric field. And then of course you can reverse that as well. So that's the definition of the ferroelectric, which is also a piezoelectric. And those have different applications uh, in you know, different engineering applications. So any questions about dielectrics or, um, <clears throat> piezoelectrics. Oh, so, so someone mentioned watches. Yeah, yeah, quartz, quartz are used in watches. Yeah, like I said, I, I think it has to do with the timing. Uh, the harmonics, the harmonic symbol, if you, signal, if you get the right frequency, something in electronics makes it keep count of the time. Um, I forget, I don't know the specifics. Okay, if there's no questions, um, what I would like you guys to do, there are, uh, the, the department has set up some mid-quarter course evaluations. We would like to get some of your feedback. Oh, there's a question. What would be a ferroelectric material at room temperature? Oh, uh, PZT, uh, uh, most of these are ferroelectric at room temperature. The Curie temperature, uh, and it depends on the material, the Curie temperature for a lot of these materials, like lead zirconate, titanate, uh, I think barium titanate is another one. Um, it's, it's quite high. It's like above 100 degrees, I believe. So most of these are uh, ferroelectric. And there's actually more phases than tetragonal. The lower the temperature goes, it, this distorts even more the orthorhombic and then the monoclinic. And that actually also increases the dielectric constant. I think I had an example. Yeah, barium titanate has a very high dielectric constant. And one of the reasons is because of this, uh, you know, First is the non-closed packed oxygen anion lattice. So it allows the central ion to move around a lot. And if you can move it around, you, you have higher polarization. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to, and I, I will, let me put this, I will give you the link. I would like you guys to spend the rest of the class to fill out the course evaluation. Uh, for your lab summaries, don't, don't worry about making it organized. Just submit your notes. And instead, I would like you to uh, spend the time on the course evaluation, the midterm course evaluation. I'm not sure when I get the chance to look at these. I think it's more for the department. They, they want to know how the Zoom classes are going. Um, hold on, let me get the link. I, I lost track of where I put it. Okay, so I, in the chat, I put the link.
for the course evaluations. So again, please uh, spend the rest of the time filling those out for your, your lab summaries. Don't worry about organizing your thoughts too much. Just submit your notes and we'll, we'll call it good in place of you spending time on the course evaluations. And uh, if there's no, no other questions, you guys are free to go. Um, I can stick around with my slides if you guys want to look at the slides some more.